When I started paddling on wilderness rivers at the tender age of 32, one of my favorite authors was Alan Kesselheim, and one of my favorite books was Water and Sky, the story of Alan and his wife Mary Pat Zitzer, who spent 14 months and 2,000 miles going from near Jasper, Alberta to Baker Lake in the Northwest Territories. Ruby Zitzer, our next speaker, is the youngest of Alan and Mary Pat's children, who, unlike me, started paddling in utero. <laughs> As a family, they have traveled thousands of miles and have paddled, hiked, and camped for many years. Last summer, Ruby returned to do her own trip with her brother, her cousin, and a friend on the Hanbury and Thalon Rivers. From her description, it sounds like it was a trip full of exciting events, and she is here to share her wilderness journey. Please welcome Ruby Zitzer. Hi. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> My parents are some of the coolest people I know. I give them full credit for planting the adventure seed in me from the beginning. My parents, oh, is this clicker working? Ah, thank you. All right. My parents took two year long tr canoe trips across Canada, wintering over in a small cabin that they built on Lake Athabasca. Their second year included the beginning of our family. Eli was conceived in the cabin over the winter months. This wild context started a tradition of wilderness adventure in our childhood and family. These spikes of experience, moments of danger and beauty, are what we come for. These reminders to wake up. We are inoculating our children with it, my dad wrote in his book, Let Them Paddle. So yes, it all started at a very young age for me and my brothers, and it's fair to say that we didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. <laughs> but of course I wouldn't have had it any other way. My parents, Al Kesselheim and Mary Pat Zitzer, blessed myself and two brothers, Eli and Sawyer, with birth rivers. Our birth rivers are rivers that my mom was pregnant on with each of us kids. Eli's River is the Kazan in northern Canada. Sawyer's is the Yellowstone in Montana and North Dakota. And my river is the Rio Grande, along the border with Mexico. When we each came of age, 13, we returned as a family to that river and recreated the adventure. So sure enough, Eli, age 13, Sawyer, 12, and myself, 10, we returned to the Kazan River with my parents in 2004. And this is where I fell in love for the first time. The soft sphagnum moss under my feet, the endless sky, the power of the river, and most of all, the sense of sweet serenity. I felt at home in the tundra. The power of the land took over. I could feel the touch of the Inuit who inhabited the land not long ago. They held me. I felt safe and comfortable in spite of the epic nature of that summer, full of headwinds, cold, black flies, and storms. I knew that I would return. No matter how often I go, the tundra continues to surprise me. I will always be in love with the tundra and will be forever married to the mountains, especially the mountains of Montana where I grew up. The tundra will remain an endless playground for me to explore. We learn to love the land and enjoy the carefree, little distraction lifestyle. Although I'm sure it was a lot more stressful for my parents. As kids, in order to stay entertained and warm on the Kazan, my brothers and I would play many games. One of the games involved putting on our life jackets and setting up a start and finish line. One person was it, and the other two tried to get to the finish line before the person could tackle them. As we pummel, pummeled each other, the land would gently embrace our bodies with softness and cushion. I have nothing but memories of horizon-wide landscapes, eye-opening encounters with wildlife, ancient Inuit sites, millions and bugs, and overall contentment from the Kazan trip. The next summer was Sawyer's coming-of-age trip on the Yellowstone. Not far from Bozeman, we made the drive in a short morning and started the trip with many friends. This trip was a beautiful, carefree, logistically easy, consistent current the whole time and as much swimming as there was paddling most days. 
This trip was over in a quick 21 days. Ever since we left the Kazan, I longed to go back. I often thought about it, daydreaming in class, wishing to be there. Eventually, I was able to return to the tundra when I was 13. I had begged my parents to let the North be a part of my coming-of-age river trip along with the Rio Grande. So finally, my parents gave in. The winter of 2007, we did the long drive to Big Bend, Texas to paddle the Rio Grande over Christmas break to ensure that there would be enough water flowing in the now small river. But earlier, during the summer of 2007, we set out to paddle the South Seal in Hudson Bay. Since the Seal was not technically my birth river, Eli decided to not join us on this expedition and went to a soccer camp instead. So the four of us set out back to the tundra. And once again, love filled my heart and the sense of belonging overwhelmed my body. The Seal was an amazing trip with beautiful weather, hardly any bugs, not much wind, a wonderful 21-day trip. That is until we got off the river and onto Hudson Bay, where we had to make a decision. Did we want to spend thousands of dollars to shuttle, or would we paddle the polar bear-populated shore? We decided that instead of paying thousands of dollars to get, to, the, to get a boat shuttle to Churchill, that we would instead paddle to Churchill ourselves. Using the tidal charts, we paddled while the tide was high. Our first night, we got caught by high tide in the middle of the night and spent hours bumping along and tasting the water in hopes of tasting fresh water from the tributary rivers to get a vague sense of where we were. Our only real guides were the distant lights of Churchill some 40 miles away. All exhausted, it was just beginning to get light around 4 a.m. The tide was on its way out and we planned to look for camp. As I looked to shore, there was an obvious white on the horizon. I turned to my parents, starting to cry, telling them to look on shore. Standing on the horizon was a polar bear. That amazing, powerful beast looked at us, and then it began to trot towards us, entering the water and swimming after us. I was crying at this point, and pretty white. <laughs> my parents were having an oh shit moment, and Sawyer was attempting to lighten the mood, but was clearly scared. The bear eventually returned to shore, but followed us along land for about five miles until we came to Button Bay, a six-mile crossing on open water, a highly unadvised crossing to make. We decided to make the crossing in hopes of dropping the bear. Two hours later, still scared, emotionally and physically exhausted, we made it to the other side. At this point, we had paddled nonstop for almost 24 hours and had covered roughly 40 miles, mostly on ocean. We set up the bear fence, which wasn't all that reassuring after seeing the size of the bear's paws. My dad took to his journal, and the three of us took to the tent to sleep. Four hours later, we sat, sat like sheep inside the bear fence and ate breakfast. As we made small talk about the last 24 hours, another bear came over the horizon. It stopped about 100 yards from us, craned its neck, and smelled our fire. Then it turned around and booked it in the opposite direction. Thank you, bear, my dad exclaimed. What we planned on being our camp for the night and remainder of the rest of the day was packed up quickly and in the boats, ready to finish the last dozen miles to Churchill, where we sought safety from the bears. We arrived that afternoon with pods of hundreds of beluga whales welcoming our arrival. That was the last of the birth rivers. Yet the adventures continued. The four of us went back to the north in 2013 to paddle the Yellowknife River. This was quite the epic. The plan was to paddle up the Yellowknife to see how far we could get in 30 days. Turns out we really didn't get that far. After about 70 miles of upstream paddling and too many thick forested portages around falls and rapids, we decided we didn't want to do it any longer. So we turned around and set out to get as far as we could on Great Slave Lake. The lake was beautiful, and because we didn't really have a destination and planned to do an out and back, we took our time. We stopped if there was a beautiful camp or if the weather was bad, but didn't press on too hard. I was aching for an epic, for that push, a goal, or destination. I had been scheming before we left that summer to plan a trip of my own. A year later, I decided it was time. I year... Uh, I yearned for an intense, strenuous trip, so I started by talking to Sawyer. 
my brother, my best friend, and my partner in crime, in hopes that he would be on board. Sure enough, after the idea was on the table, he was in. So we began planning, wanting to find a route in the north that we, would have, that we wouldn't have to fly both in and out of, a trip without polar bears, and somewhere neither of us had been. What we found was a thousand mile route starting in Yellowknife on Great Slave Lake and ending in Baker Lake. We would drive to Yellowknife, paddle the 270 miles of the north arm of Great Slave, do the 25 mile Pikes Portage over the Heidel Land to the Hanbury, and connect onto the Thelon River via the Hanbury and flow into Baker Lake. We planned on 50 days, but hoped to do it in less. It would mean averaging 20 or so miles a day. The crew would be myself, Sawyer, our cousin Quinn, and our friend Kelly. In hopes of getting back in time for Sawyer to go to a Nordic ski camp in the beginning of August, we left in early June. By day seven, we were feeling triumphant, already a little over 100 miles into the trip, and then day eight came. On day eight, we ran into serious ice. Before day eight, there had been some ice, and a few times we had, there were too much to move. So we would have to wait an hour or so in order for the ice to shift and allow a pathway for us to travel through. Yet this ice blocked the entire northern arm of the lake for as far as we could see. In two days, we made it about four miles, throwing boulders at the ice in an attempt to break a channel free. We shoved it all around with our paddles. The moving was slow, frustrating, exhausting, and not sustainable. So after talking and brainstorming, we planned to turn around and paddle back 50 miles to a fishing camp we passed earlier. At this point, people were either feeling emotional, attempting to stay positive, and or trying not to think about all the possible outcomes. I just couldn't stop thinking. A full year of planning and logistics and we have to stop on day eight due to ice? This can't be happening. But as per usual, we all overreacted. We arrived at a fishing camp in two and a half days. We were welcomed with opened arms, gooey grilled cheese, hot showers, and utter compassion. We were also welcomed by raining ash and thick forest fire smoke. Turns out we happened to be in the part of Northwest Territories that was having the worst fire season they'd have in, had in over 100 years. The fire was 10 miles from the camp and they were preparing to have a possible evacuation. Even with all of this going on at the camp, they allowed us to use their phone. We were able to call Dave Olson, a connection that we had. My dad taught Dave at Northland College back in the day, and Dave now lives with his wife, two kids, and 40 sled dogs on the shore of Great Slave Lake, completely off the grid. We were incredibly lucky to talk to him. He was reassuring and confident that the trip would and must go on. The ice will have moved out. You guys can totally do it, he reassured us on the phone. If you need more food, we will send it with you. Rice, flour, hot cocoa, whatever you need if you feel like you're a little shy, he offered. Right after the call finished, the fire still raging, we left the camp with many embraces, pure gratitude for all the camp employees. Two days earlier, we felt hopeless and stuck. We came to the area where the ice had first stopped us. Miraculously, it was completely clear, as if the ice had never been there. We pushed hard the next four days, 35, 40 mile days on the lake to get to Dave's house, trying to make up for the time we'd lost. It wasn't easy, but we were riding a high from the first, for the first two days. Ice free, it felt as though the ice scare had never even happened. Dave and Kristen were more amazing than we had ever imagined. They'd built almost all they owned with their own two hands. Trails they cut through the woods for the dogs and their daughters to work out and explore on. They live in a beautiful cabin with a quaint guest cabin and a big workshop. It is all on a sand beach tucked away in a perfect bay away from all the noise of society and over 100 miles from the road. The perfect spot to fall in love with the land and yourself. We ate one of the best meals I'd ever had. It was like pulled pork but actually pulled caribou and salad and potatoes. We ate until we couldn't move and then we ate cake. <laughs> We didn't want to leave, but we had to, for we only had so many days worth of food. They supplied us with some more rice and flour, which Sawyer, being the only male and six foot four, was very relieved about. We, go, we woke up to the first perfect, calm, sunny day since we'd left the fishing camp. 
We said our goodbyes, hoping to see them again and fighting off the urge to stay and be parented and taken care of for the next couple days. Being with them made me long for the steady, calm, confident hand of my dad leading the way and the laughter, love, and adventures of my mom. We paddled in silence a lot of that morning, making big crossings, knowing we were about to start a big chapter of our trip and about to finish a different challenge. We got to Pike's Portage that day. It called for a victory dance. 270 miles done, 20 days in. Heck yeah, I thought as we danced around. We were warned early in the trip by a native man in a small village on Great Slave Lake about Pike's Portage. After telling him our, our route, all he had to say was, Pike's Portage, that's a long fucking portage. <laughs> we shrugged it off. Turns out we shouldn't have. It is a long fucking portage. We paddled 20 ma lake miles that morning and then did a five mile portage, but had to do two carries. So it turned into a 15 mile carry and we finished at midnight. That was a rough day to say the least. Hot, smoky, buggy with a canoe on your shoulders or with an awkward amount of weight distributed por poorly. When portaging, it seems you always have to carry a little more than you can comfortably hold. At one point, I remember thinking, God, I hope we see a bear so I can just lay down. <laughs> the next morning, I felt as though I'd been hit by a truck, and we still had 20 miles left of one to three mile portages in between two to four mile lake crossings. The problem with these trips is that no matter how badly you don't want to start a fire in the morning for coffee, or paddle in the wind, or do 20 miles of portages, you have to. You're out there and that is what you're doing. You're, so reluctantly and stiffly, we packed up the canoes and paddled a mile to the first portage. That day we started at 8 a.m. and got done with the portage at one. We all vowed to never do Pike's Portage again. The next morning was the 4th of July. We celebrated by waking up on Artillery Lake with 20 mile an hour headwinds. I looked out on the white capped lake and smiled, laying back down. You can't feel bad about not paddling if it's too dangerous, and we were all so exhausted. We were trying our best not to look at the watch, so knew, who knows what time we ended up getting up that morning. We made cinnamon rolls, did laundry, and reminisced about the prior day's events as the wind tried to blow us out of camp. That first day of wind was the start of 14 days straight of headwinds. We soon got in the habit, when it was cold, to suit up in our life jackets at lunch, sprinting around, yeti calling, and tackling each other to the ground, laughing the whole way. A good reminder that, we, that it had been hard, but we wanted to be there. We chose to be there, and we were enjoying ourselves. Society makes us go up, grow up too quickly. If it were up to me, I would still wrestle with Sawyer at least once a week. Life is so busy back in society, but up north, there's always enough time to tackle each other to warm up. We didn't have much leeway as we had originally planned, so we had little room to not paddle. We struggled day after day against the wind, thinking it would be okay once we made it to the Hanbury, where the current would push us downstream. The current helps, but the headwind still pushes you back mentally and physically. The Hanbury was littered with rapid hash marks. What we soon discovered were some hash marks, although may appear the same on the map, were sometimes small falls, while others were fun, easy wave trains. Day after day, we thought we would easily make miles on the great current section, but would end up with one to five porridges around falls. This day of easy miles we talked about, dreamt about, and longed for never came. On our last day of the Hanbury, we had a long day of portages around Dickinson Canyon. On the last two mile portage, we ran into our first people in 32 days. A group of boys from a camp in Minnesota that Kelly had gone to as a kid. It felt weird to talk to them, to compare, and to suddenly think more about what you were saying or how you scarfed down lunch. Their group had a few grizzly bear issues, which surprised us. At this point, we had seen no signs of bear. They were a group of 12 and we were a group of four and hadn't even seen a track. Then we started to think about it. Since we left Dave and Kristen's house, we were pushing 30 to 45 miles a day, fighting headwinds, leaving camp either at 4 a.m. and getting to camp around eight, or starting to paddle around nine and finishing around midnight. 
The window that we were in camp wasn't long at all. We said our goodbyes, wished them the best of luck, and we're on our way, finally, to the Thelon. The Thelon is a massive river, but disappointingly sluggish the first two days. The river banks were thick with willows and swamps with no good camps. That first day, the river valley filled with smoke, the current barely flowed, our morales were low, our expectations disappointed by the weak flow of the river. We had been telling ourselves, once we got to the Thelon, it would be easier. But once again, we were wrong. We then had a good week plus of rain, with strong winds some days. Although, as we continued on the Thelon, it became increasingly beautiful, more barren, and much harder to find firewood. We spent at least an hour when we got to camp to collect wood, giving a solid fist pump for a twig bigger than your pointer finger. Five days before our last day was Quinn's birthday. That morning, we got up at 4 a.m. to get miles under our belt before breakfast. Within the first hour, we saw four grizzly bears and two cubs. That afternoon, we saw the sixth bear of the day. We were pretty ready to not see them anymore. It was getting less cool and increasingly scary. I packed a chocolate cake to cook in the Dutch oven for Quinn's birthday. It was the best cake we ever had, and we each ate a fourth of it, and there was nothing left. <laughs> At this point in the trip, we were averaging 50 to 60 miles on the river and 35 to 40 on the lakes. The lack of sleep was beginning to catch up with us, and the stress of the last three big lakes before the water slide section of the Thelon was starting to wear on us. We heard horror stories of people getting windbound on these lakes for days. With our luck, it felt like a high possibility. Somehow, we had perfect weather. We were so afraid of the weather turning on us that we pushed hard to get done with these miles. We successfully got to the waterside section, a 60-mile section that we were told had so much current you could easily do the 60 miles in a day without really paddling. It was nice current, but we had one hell of a headwind. Still, we did the 60 miles and pulled into Baker Lake on day 41. Feeling weathered, tired, physically strong, and so proud of our accomplishments. Although we struggled a lot this trip and felt as though Mother Nature was working against us, there were so many moments when I would look around and feel overwhelmed by the huge beauty, the vastness of the land, the feeling of complete desolation and utter satisfaction. I would look at Sawyer and feel nothing but gratitude and love for him, the moments when I would easily complete camp tasks and mentally thanking my parents for handing that knowledge down to me. Or when, I would, or when we had to make hard decisions about safety or weather, and I would think, what would Big A do? Big A is my dad. On the last day, we hiked up to a high point off the river. We all stood together on the rocks, looking out over the land falling beneath us, the vast, lush beauty surrounding us. I didn't want to go. When would I be back? But then I thought about it. Nothing will stop me from returning to the tundra. If you haven't been to the north where the lands embrace you, where you hear breathing and the buzz of insects with no background noise, where you feel and see your body as a powerful, beautiful tool to be cherished. So go, I promise you, you will not regret it. You will come back a better person and you will fall in love, maybe for the first time in too long. And you will leave with a giddy feeling as if you know a secret only a few others know. And after you go home, hold that flame of memory close and promise to return. <laughs>